Hi guys, David Michael here. I want to do a video on winter trees, identifying winter trees, and I want to keep most of them easy. Hopefully there's some things that I can say that are going to help you identify trees without seeing the leaves or having examples of leaves in the winter. And this particular tree is a honey locust tree, and I didn't get a good example of it, and I did it on purpose because this is one of the easiest ones to identify aside from sycamore or birch. Um, and that is because of these really large gnarly thorns that grow on its trunk on its branches they grow everywhere I don't need to show you the bark on this tree or the shape of this tree and that's why I picked one that's got poison ivy on it's got grapevine that I'm holding in my hand and poison ivy going up and down the trunk but it's really easy to see these thorns these really gnarly thorns I wouldn't want them in me for sure the honey locust tree really easy to identify in the winter. This is one tree that's really easy to identify in the winter. This is called American Hornbeam. In some parts of the country it's referred to as Blue Beach. It has a beech smooth bark, but you can see how muscly this tree is. It's nicknamed in some part of the country's Ironwood, but so is hop horn beam, which is what uh, the people of my community where I grew up considered to be the true ironwood. This tree doesn't get very big. It is a tree. It's not a shrub. It hangs onto its leaves late into the year. But you can see with the bark how unmistakable the tree has a beech-like bark with this muscle-like structure, sinuous even. It is really hard. It grows in small stands. You can see these through here. Really easy to identify. Here's another tree that's really easy to identify. Or at least I think it's really easy to identify. It's the shag bark hickory. Now the bark peels up. And in a lot of cases it'll peel up from the top side and the bottom side of the bark. So it just looks like it's peeling all the way up. Now there are several species of hickory and there are at least two species that I'm aware of in my area that shags out like this, the king nut and the shag bark. But they are easy to identify, easy to spot, no leaves. Here's another one that I consider to be really easy to identify in the winter. If you look at these circular jewels in the bark, and if you look down, you see how they kind of form a pattern of almost hexagonal jewels. This is flowering dogwood. Pretty easy to recognize. Let's go hunt down some easy ones. The shag bark hickory um, in my neck of the woods, it's almost iconic. It's appeared in a country and western song from Alabama, I do believe. Uh, shag, a long tall hickory, bend it over skinning cats, I believe is the lyrics. Anyway, what makes a hickory easy to identify, a shag bark hickory easy to identify, is this bark that's peeling. Now, one of the key things in a tree that isn't peeling bark as dramatically as this one is, uh, to separate it from black cherry is black cherry will have a round jewel shaped bark that will peel from different directions. The shag bark hickory tends to peel up and down from the upside and from the downside. And that makes it extremely easy to identify in the winter with no leaves. The iconic shag bark hickory. What makes willow a really easy tree to identify in the winter without leaves? 
not only the shape, the large willows, you'll see this furled bark that resembles shag bark. But what you'll notice is that it usually has suckers coming out of it. These suckers coming out of it. And then the leaf axles usually are laying all over the ground even after a snow they shed. So there's sheddings all over the ground. I'm in a wetland area. I have a kind of a, I would call it almost an orange hue, shaggy uh, beige bark. The trees can le lean and bend and turn and make all these really peculiar yoga positions. That's what separates the tree from, for me. So the yoga tree, now the willow is a wonderful tree and these suckers are what I would consider to be the key identifying feature. And secondary would be finding these sheds all over the ground around the tree. Willow. Another easy tree to identify in the winter to me is the hawthorn. Some people call it black haw. Some people just call it hawthorn. Some people call it haw apple. It gets a small apple on it that some people use in preserves. But it is a twisted shrubby tree that you see on the outskirts a lot of times it's a shrubby tree and it has thorns the thorns are one of the key identifying features of the tree and earlier in this video i showed you the honey locust and i said what makes it easy to identify are the big nasty thorns that are on it well in this particular instance if you notice the thorns on this have this hook shape on the branches and the thorns that are on the branches are actually the same bark that's on the twig rather than being glossed up and real shiny like you see on and sometimes they're even blunt but on honey locust the tree gets much bigger it's a compound leaf the hawthorn is not this gets an apple on it the bark is really jeweled and a lot of times has moss on it which you can see that it's it's jeweled. It's nowhere near real tiny geometric jewels on it. Nowhere near the smooth gray bark of a young honey locust or the deep furled scaly bark of an older honey locust. The hawthorn, another easy tree to identify in the winter. This one is a little more difficult to identify, but if you Look at the subtle hints of the tree. It's muscular, a lot like the blue beech that I showed you in this video. And you can see the bark just barely scales up just a little bit. You see how scaly it is up there where Dawn's panning up. And then if you look closely at the bark, it's really tight, really skin tight, but loose. Now this is hop hornbeam. This is the iron wood from my neck of the woods. Relatively easy tree to identify. It gets a wafer like hop seed on it. The squirrels absolutely love them This is an extremely hard wood. It burns really well And a lot of people mistake it for elm another easy tree to identify Okay, a big one there and this one here is cherry and what makes cherry different not only just the color but it's scaly from the left and right and from the top and from the bottom. It scales in every direction. So it's kind of a scaly jewel shaped bark. And when you peel the bark back, a lot of times you see an orange hue to it. Wild black cherry. Relatively easy to identify in the winter. Let's go see how many more I can fit into this video. Oaks can be overwhelming because there are just so many oaks. And if you were trying to learn your trees and you started with oaks, you'd see that, you know, there's gamble oak, black oak, red oak, pin oak, scarlet oak, turkey oak, live oak, shingle oak, 
swamp white oak, white oak, chestnut oak, chinkapin oak. It just keeps going and going and going, and it seems to overwhelm a lot of people that are just starting. So my advice is to split oak into two categories. One is the red category, and the other is the white category. The red category of oak have pointed leaves, whereas the white oak, including live oak, have round lobes. But of all the oaks, the one oak in my particular area that is easy to identify without its leaves in the winter, to me, is the pin oak, which is basically a red oak. And red oak has similar bark. And the bark on the red oak, the black oak, and the pin oak, when they're young, they have this furl that's kind of dark, but in between the furls, they have this glass gray smooth skin that's really tight. But what separates pin oaks usually in the winter time is if you look up, they have these tiny, tiny twiggy branches that uh, resemble pine trees. So they're kind of a cone-shaped tree when they're in the forest with other trees that they're competing with. If you planted one in your lawn, it would still be kind of pine cone shaped. The branches towards the top of the tree lean upward and the branches towards the bottom of the tree, once you get to the center, lean downward. Those are two distinguishing features that separate pin oak in the winter from red oak, black oak, and other oaks in the red oak category. I hope that tidbit helped. I don't really have an easy way of showing you guys how to identify a white oak tree without its leaves. I could say that white oak leaves tend to hang on to remnants of their leaves in the winter, but so do several other species of oak. But if you look at the bark, it's a deep furled bark and it has this white hue to it compared to other oaks. It's really light in color, but it does have its own shape. And once you get used to seeing them with the leaves on, they'll be easy for you to spot in the winter in the woods. Another example of a red oak that we call the black oak is right here. And a major distinguishing feature from the black oak is that it doesn't have that white hue but it will have pointed leaves and it comes from knowing that this tree is a black oak and not a red it comes from being here many times for me to know that but black oaks i spot generally because of the shape of the tree the deep furled bark and its size and it lacks that skin that tight gray skin that you see on a red oak in between the furls which is in the example that i showed you in a portion of the video where I discussed the red oak. But white oak is not necessarily an easy one. I can't say that it belongs in this video. I can't say that the black oak, which is in the red category, belongs in this video because neither are really that easy to identify. There's another white oak right here, this big one. You can see it's got white splotches on it. And in some species of white oak, because there are a few, the bark tends to scale out and shag out. And in my neck of the woods, that particular species of oak was referred to by the old timers as shagbark oak, which just kind of further confounds it for a lot of people. Anyway, white oak, it's the best I can do for this video, but I couldn't do a video on trees without including the oak species. Now I picked a couple here that aren't going to be what I consider easy for most people, but it is an important uh, tree to know, the ash and the elm. I'm going to show you both real quick and how to differentiate between the two. This is a young ash. It's still alive after the emerald ash borer came through. It's kind of a shock. It's not a box elder, um, which is another tree that people tend to confuse with it. But one of the key factors I wanted to show you is this branch right here. If you can see, I don't know whether you can see this, but on maples, ash, dogwood, and buckeye, the branches will always be opposite. Now, there won't necessarily always be a branch on the other side, but as you go up the branch, you see that the twigs are always opposite of one another. And it's only on ash, maple, buckeye, and dogwood. So this has an elm-like bark. You can see the yellowish color to it. 
and this is a white ash and most people mistake it for elm. Now the elm tree is over here and you can see kind of what makes people confuse elm with ash but if you notice the bark comes off a lot easier and if you, we had a twig I could show you a twig they will not be opposite of one another they'll be alternated the twigs going down the branch so American elm and white ash now these trees are significant for the spring mushroom hunters that love to find those morales Let's go look at some easier ones. Hopefully you can see this from a distance. I'll have Don come up closer in a minute. But if you look at the pattern on the bark of this tree, you see the white and the dark and the white and the dark and just the different hues and shades of color makes it look almost spotted. Now this is the young version of it as it gets older of course you'll notice that the bark will furrow and deepen but if you look up the tree you can also see that there are curious eye spots where there were branches it sheds its branches as it grows tall and this is one of the tallest trees in eastern north america this is the tulip tree yellow poplar some people call it uh, Liriodendrum, I do believe, is the Latin name. Now, what's significant about learning this tree is it has the four fingers on it. It resembles a maple leaf, only I call it the four-fingered Martian because it has four points. It's real soft. They come to soft points. It's a really neat tree. But what makes this significant and important in my neck of the woods is if I was looking for ginseng, I would look in tulip poplar stands. And if I was looking for a very early species of Morshella called the Demenative, I would be looking in yellow poplar stands, which is information that I know the outdoorsmen around me don't have. Very neat tree, largest east of, eastern North American tree. Tulip, yellow poplar, Liriodendrum. These things get huge. I remember reading about 20 years ago that uh, it was either Jefferson or Franklin had planted a tree in one of the Carolinas and it's still there, still alive. Can't remember which, forgive me for that. Let's go look at some more trees. The American basswood tree is an interesting tree it gets quite large it has heart-shaped leaves and one end of that heart on the lobe of the heart always looks like it's cleaved off so it's a very unique leaf and it makes it easy to recognize when it has leaves but what makes it easy to recognize in the winter for me is the tight furled bark and kind of this usually it's a tall slender tree till it starts to get really old it grows fast but the neat thing is is this odd looking black ring that you see and you'll see it go all the way up the tree on the younger trees in the stands of basswood and if you look closely like right here at this line that goes around it it's actually a woodpecker mark now i do not have an explanation for why woodpeckers do this to basswood trees but if you were to stand back and look at it from a distance you will see this perfect kind of halo ring going around the tree as it goes up. And that is a distinguishing feature that really makes basswood, American basswood, some people call it linden, stand out. It's also a very soft hardwood. Uh, the wood, you can put tacks in it easily. It makes an excellent plate for a bow drill. Uh, the scouts used it quite often. I think the world record start to flame bow drill contest was 6.9 seconds most people can't open a book of matches that fast don't quote me on that i think i'm right i'm not 100 percent sure though american basswood easy to identify the woodpecker rings around the tree are always in a tight line and just this species as far as i know maybe i should be um, more attentive but i don't recall seeing it on any other tree 
Let's go see some more. The Kentucky coffee tree is fast shrinking across the eastern United States. It's disappearing because squirrels and birds don't transport the seeds. It usually transports itself with rivers and watersheds. So the seeds don't go very far past the mother tree and it's in small stands. But according to what I read, they're blaming it on over harvest. When initially, I don't think that there were very many trees when we settled the states in the first place. But what makes the Kentucky coffee tree easy to identify is the scaly bark, it's gray. And if you note the twigs at the top of the tree, don't get narrow. They don't come to sharp points. They don't get thin, they don't taper down. They looked winged and edged and blunt. And typically the tree hangs on to pods throughout the winter. Now the pods are short, thick, compared to the honey locust, its cousin, which are long and narrow. Now these bean pods were used by the settlers. That'll be a whole different video on how to utilize the Kentucky coffee tree. The seeds are poisonous and if they aren't prepared properly, you can't get rid of the toxin, but there is a way to use it for a coffee substitute. And I might do a video on that this year if I can find a stand of Kentucky coffee trees that want to relinquish their pods for me. Anyway, it's an easy tree to identify. It's fast shrinking. I know it's on the endangered species list in Ontario. And I hope to see something done to help expedite its recovery in Indiana and Michigan soon. The hackberry tree is another tree that's really easy to identify. It has these really thick, my fingers here, you can see how deep this is, really wedgy, corky bark. It has a really hard seed on it that is edible, but when I've tried it, I don't think I would recommend eating it as a survival staple. How would you collect enough to get a meal and just one of those things where you can eat it, but why would you? Anyway, hackberry tree is a beautiful wedgy corky bark tree. Uh, when we were kid, when I was a kid, this was part of our firewood staple, and it does not split very well. The wood is super grainy; it doesn't come apart very easy. And this was one of the hardest trees we had to split because it just so stringy and, and, and hung together. I noticed that there was a Kentucky coffee tree back here behind the hackberry. I wanted to have Dawn show the difference. Because this is a younger Kentucky coffee tree and we did have it in the video, I wanted to show how this bark kind of peels back sideways. And it's really light in color compared to the black cherry, which also has a bark that gets scaly and peely like this. And of course, another young hackberry right here with the wedgy corky bark. Let's go see what else we can find. One of the things that really stands out about large sassafras trees is the deep, deep furled bark with an orange hue to it. As the tree begins to die, the bark comes off easy and has this orange look to it. When you rub your hands on it, when you knock bark off, it'll get this orange hue to it. But as far as the larger trees go, they have these odd geometric shapes that make it stand out like this dead branch that's all twisted and turned. And then if we go to the examples of the sassafras that's important for harvest, you can see these odd twists and turns that make sassafras stand out. Now as far as harvesting sassafras, you always want to do it before it gets the leaves, so it's kind of important to know how to tell the difference. You can see hopefully in the camera just how green these twigs are. They're really, really green. 
and then as they go down to the base that smooth green bark changes to a rough orange hued bark at the base you can see as the tree got this sapling got bigger that you have the rough bark but on the twigs it'll have this smooth pretty green hue a sassafras is what I use for a summer tea it's very aromatic you can tell it's sassafras just by smelling it it'll have an almost a root beer smell originally root beer came from sassafras not sarsaparilla however you can make sassafras out of both or you can make a sarsaparilla tea and you can make a sassafras tea that have very unique flavors sassafras is one that I harvest quite often we'll do a video on that this spring but sassafras is an easy tree to identify in the winter because of its geometric shapes and its deep furled orange hued bark relatively easy tree or one of the easiest trees I think there is to identify in the winter is the sycamore tree you can see it has this camouflage look to the bark and as you go higher on the tree it'll get super smooth and turn up a, a cream white but the bark is flaky and scaly towards the bottom peels off really easily pieces laying on the ground it has a very large leaf that a lot of people mistake with a maple leaf. There's an example of a sycamore leaf right there. Not a maple. Sycamore. Its seed pod um, kind of floats in the wind. It's, it's a round ball that explodes into a cottony substance that resembles cattails. Sycamore tree is really easy to identify. They get huge. They go around, uh, grow around rivers and lakes and streams. As a kid, I was fascinated with this tree. I used to pretend the bark was bacon, but it didn't taste like bacon. <laughs> Let's go see something else. Another easy tree to identify in the winter is the speckled alder. The speckled alder has a really tight, smooth bark. And you can see these white lines on it that looks like Morse code. Now, young cherry will have a similar effect, but it won't have straight lines like this that looks like Morse code. And then the one feature that really stands out for speckled alder and knowing that you have it is it's a deciduous tree that has a tiny cone on it. Tiny, cute little cones and catkins. It has both, catkins and cones. You get up north on a UP, the tag altar is really rough to walk through. You can't really navigate it very well. Anyway, speckled alder very easy tree to identify it burns really hot for being a wetland type hardwood in fact if I remember right reading in history alder was what brought us out of the Bronze Age in southern Michigan there's not a lot of white birch to confuse with this. But this is an easy tree to identify in the winter. This is quaking aspen. There are two versions in this part of the state. Big tooth aspen and quaking aspen. They start out white when they're young. And at a distance they do look like paper birch, kind of. But paper birch, the bark will peel sideways really easily. And you'll see it peeling. Whereas aspen will be white, and as it gets bigger and it gets bigger around, as it comes down towards the base, the bark will start to furl out and turn a dark gray. 
I know this is quaking aspen because there's no teeth on this one. But it's an easy one to identify in the winter. It's beautiful, it's white, and I do believe they make paper out of this tree, quaking aspen. Hi guys, David Michael here. I wanted to show you guys some trees that are pretty easy to identify in the winter. What makes this one easy to identify is that if you look up, it has a smooth bark, and as it comes down, it starts to scale out. But what makes this one really interesting and what makes this one a solid identification is these eye-like circles that look like fish gills or eyelids that you see on this tree, which is indicative of the red maple. Now there are many, many maples, and the one thing that I should stress about people learning their trees is rather than try to learn the dozens of oak species and the dozens of maple species, to just learn to differentiate the hard maples from the soft maples, um, the sinuses are deep and the softer maples like silver maple and red maple the sinuses are pretty deep compared to your black maple and your sugar maple and your rock maple but this is an easy tree to identify in the winter because the bark starts out scaly and most of the time it'll have these circular patterns in it and then as it goes up it'll get really gray smooth now another easy tree to identify is this one right here, which I'm going to go over here because it's a little better example. These get really big. This is your beech tree. The Latin name of the beech tree is Fagus grandifolia. Now in your smaller trees throughout the woods, you'll be able to see that the leaves are still hanging on and they'll hang on all winter, even though it's a deciduous tree. Uh, the higher trees lose their leaves due to wind, rain, snow, ice, things of that nature. but this tree will get really big. The bark will always be this gray, smooth, really tight bark that you can't peel off or, or in any way damage with your hands. Whereas most trees have bark that you can peel with your fingers or furrows that you can stick your fingers into. This is the tree that you see a lot of people carve into. The American beech tree. Let's go see if we can find one more easy tree to identify. This is a really neat tree uh, because it's a deciduous evergreen. Now I've showed you guys deciduous conifers. This is a deciduous evergreen. So it kind of distinct, help you distinguish that there really is a difference between pine tree, evergreen, and conifer and deciduous. And there's a kind of a mix and a mash that confounds it with certain species. But this is the American holly, and this is a little further north than it normally occurs where Dawn and I are. This was planted by a naturalist in this county park. But it's an easy deciduous tree to identify in the winter because of these beautiful waxy leaves. And they're actually a thorn on the end of them, or I wouldn't call it a thorn, I would just say that it will poke you. They get red berries on it. It's an easy tree to identify because it holds its leaves and because of the shape of the leaf and because of the beautiful red berries that I think everyone recognizes as a traditional uh, American Christmas icon, the American holly. So anyway, safe and happy foraging guys. I hope the information that I gave you really helps you identify some trees in the winter there is no way i could go through every tree in northeastern united states in one video it would take way too long safe and happy foraging